Inequalities, uh, especially linear inequalities, are often used to express conditions. So, for instance, in Canada, the voting age is 18. We can write that with the following statement. We can say age greater than or equal to 18 years. Now, what does this really mean? Well, it has to be within a context. So, we can say if somebody voted, then their age must be greater than or equal to 18 years. Or if somebody voted legally, then their age must be greater than or equal to 18 years. Or if somebody's age is greater than or 18, greater than or equal to 18 years, then they are legally entitled to vote. Of course, there are other conditions like citizenship. Um, all of you have probably been to a uh, playground or a, an amusement park and seen um, roller coasters that have height restrictions. So we can express that with a, an inequality. We can say height must be greater than or equal to some height, let's say 120 centimeters, in order to safely ride the roller coaster. Um, in British Columbia, you need a special motorcycle license in order to drive a motorized scooter beyond a certain capacity. So, you know, what allows you to drive a uh, motorcycle uh, scooter without a license? Well, if the engine capacity is less than 51 cubic centimeters, then you're allowed to drive a motor, a motor scooter without a license. Now, inequalities are used all the time in programming languages to set up decisions. So, for instance, you will very commonly see a, a line in a program, uh, in doesn't matter what language, but uh, this is sort of pseudocode here. If t is greater than 2, then you know, do something. And this is a core feature of every programming language. So you end up using inequalities all the time. So one of the differences between uh, inequalities and equations is uh, that a graph is very commonly associated with the solution to an inequality. It allows for a visual understanding of what you are actually claiming, and it also makes it much easier to check your solution. So how do you graph inequalities? Well, let's take a look at a few examples. If we have x greater than 2, we need to draw a number line. You don't need to pull out a ruler. This is only really just sort of to get a visual idea of what's going on. Usually you try to position uh, the number on the right, 2, in somewhere in the center, and I usually just do a tick mark and put a 2, and then maybe I'll do a few on either side. Again, these are just approximations, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, x greater than 2, this is known as a strict inequality, and to, in order to diagram a strict inequality, we put a hollow circle at the 2. So this is an indication that 2 is not really part of this solution. We can't really say that 2 is greater than 2, but anything to the right of on this graph is greater than 2. And so we shade in as best we can anything to the right of 2 and then finish it off with some sort of little arrow. So we're indicating that our solution contains everything on this number line to the right of 2. And it's worthwhile actually trying and plugging in something here to see if that's true. For instance, if we pick a 3, does that lead to a true statement? Is 3 greater than 2? Yes. If we go to the left of our hollow circle, we should get a false statement. So if you plug in 0, which is often one of the easiest things to plug in, do we get a false statement? 0 greater than 2 is false, and so it shouldn't be part of the solution, and we haven't graphed it. So how do we graph um, something very similar, but not a strict inequality, like x is greater than or equal to 2? Well, you end up with the same looking graph except, and we'll try to put the 2 in the middle, we'll have the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, except now you have a solid circle. So the solid circle is an indication that 2 is part of this solution, as is everything to the right of 2. Now some people look at um, the solution on the left and say, well why can't we just put a solid circle at 3 and then go to the right of that? Well there are some values in between 2 and 3 that are still part of this solution to the inequality on the left, x greater than 2. So for instance, 2.1. In fact, we can get as close as we like to 2, and in mathematical 
language, we often say we can get arbitrarily close to 2. So how do we indicate that we can get really, really close to 2, like 2.000001, for instance, without actually including 2? Well, we just do this with the hollow circle. So let's take a look at a couple more. What if we have x less than 5 or x less than or equal to 5? Again, these are just really rough diagrams to give us a visual idea of what's going on. Put the 5 somewhere in the middle of this. Put a couple of tick marks on either side. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, for instance, there. We'll do the same over here. 5 in the middle. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And a hollow circle for x is less than 5. And shade in everything to the left with an arrow. And then a solid circle for x is less than or equal to 5. And shade in everything to the left. Let's check that our graph makes sense. Let's plug in something that should yield a true statement. Again, remember I said 0 is a nice one to check. 0 is less than 5. Yeah, that's true. And so that looks OK. Plug in something to the right of uh, 5, like 7. Does that give you a true statement? 7 is less than 5? No, that's false. And so that shouldn't be part of our graph. And it isn't. And we could do the same checks with x is less than or equal to 5. Let's try graphing something involving fractions. So x is greater than 2 thirds. Or let's say x is less than or equal to negative 7 over 2. So these don't have to be precise, but you do want to locate the fraction in between its closest integer neighbors. So where is 2 thirds? 2 thirds is bigger than 0, but smaller than 1. So if you're going to graph this, you want to have 0 sort of in the middle and 1, and then maybe 2, and we can go the other side a little bit, like negative 1. So 2 thirds, well, you just have to kind of eyeball it and put this roughly 2 thirds of the way. And I usually, in this case, like to put the 2 thirds indication on the other side of the line from what I've put the uh, integers. There's no hard and fast rules that the integers should be on the bottom. You'll see some examples where the integers are on the top. Your textbook mostly has the integers on the bottom. Putting the 2 thirds on the top, though, just allows it to be kind of set, set apart a little bit. And now you can put a hollow circle, because this is a strict inequality. And you can shade in everything to the right. And uh, we just lost our line there. I accidentally erased it. So we can shade in everything to the right. And let's check uh, the first integer that should be part of our solution, 1. Is 1 greater than 2 thirds? Yes. So that looks good. Is 0 greater than 2 thirds? No. And 0 is not part of our solution as we graphed it. Let's try the same thing for negative 7 over 2. With negative fractions, it's a little trickier to locate the nearest neighbors. But this is, uh, if you write it as a mixed number, negative 3 and a half. So negative 3 and negative 4 are the nearest neighbors. Negative 4 would be less than, and negative 3 would be greater than. So put in a few of the integer neighbors. And then put negative 7 over 2 right where it belongs, sort of in between negative 4 and negative 3. We have a solid circle, because this is a less than or equal to. And then we graph everything to the left. And again, you can check the integers to make sure you've got the arrow pointing in the right direction. Negative 4, is that less than negative 7 over 2? Well, if you think of negative 7 over 2 as negative 3 and a half, then yes, negative 4 is less than or equal to negative 7 over 2.